But I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Lisa Nandy, the uh, Shadow Foreign Secretary. Uh, we're not going to be talking enormous amounts about foreign policy. <laughs> You'll be, not be amazed to know. But, I mean, just to be clear, look, massive spending this year, another £60 billion, uh, a corporation tax policy that Labour was signed up to at the last election. I mean, broadly, there's nothing here for you to quibble with, is there? You, you like this budget. Well, uh, there are certainly elements of this that come as a relief after the briefing that's been going on um, from the Treasury over the last few weeks. But in all, it is a budget that really fails to match the scale of the crisis that we've got. We've got an NHS at the moment that is seeing soaring waiting lists, high numbers of hospital admissions. You only need to walk onto any ward in any hospital in the country to see the scale of the challenge that we've got. Not only was there nothing for health, for social care in this budget, but hidden in the small print was an £8 billion clawback that had been given to the NHS in order to deal with the challenges of COVID. We just cannot go forwards as a country if the government take, doesn't take seriously the need not just to invest in our public services, but to invest in our people as well. If you squeeze the incomes of low-paid people in this country, what you find is that people aren't outspending, they aren't part of the economic recovery, the debt is worse, and the country will not recover like that. The but, Chancellor has got to do better than this. But, but, but Lisa, as a result of this crisis, we're seeing a six hundred billion pound increase in the national debt you know would you be cutting other things to you know for example give more money to the nhs or are you saying we need to spend and borrow even more the absolute priority at the moment is to protect ordinary families and ordinary businesses throughout this crisis. By borrowing more? By borrowing more? That by investing in people now so that we don't see the debt skyrocket and we deal with the consequences for many, many decades to come. At the moment, we've got a situation where the recovery is incredibly fragile. Many businesses around the country, including back home for me in Wigan, where we've been in almost permanent lockdown for a year, which was confirmed today as one of the... is the worst um, economic crisis facing any major economy because of the failure to get a grip on the health crisis, which has led to repeated and prolonged lockdown. We've got businesses who just haven't had any money coming in, any customers through the door. And what they just cannot afford right now is these delays and uncertainties that we've seen, the stop-start of the furlough scheme. We've had five extensions to the furlough scheme, people facing a cliff edge, people's jobs being lost. We've had businesses facing this hike in business rates, which they've now got a three-month reprieve. But, the, you know, the, this package of support is far too limited for the scale of the challenge that we got. The priority has to be to invest in people, to invest in those businesses, in order to make sure that people are still in work and that we come through this crisis. Lisa, I, we've got much more we want to talk to you about, so please don't go away, and you at home, please don't go away, because lots more from Lisa Nandy, John McDonnell and Baroness Morgan, just a minute or two. Welcome back. Labour's Lisa Nandy is still with me, but first, Anushka. Thank you. I want to talk to you about the Labour Party, who have dropped in the polls this week, trailing the Tories seven points. But let's put that into perspective with some really interesting analysis from Ipsos Mori. So, look, this is all about how opposition parties perform. Across the bottom is time from one election until the next election. And then here is the increase in vote share in that time. Labour under Keir Starmer is in red, and you can see there was a big spike to start with. They went 17 points up compared to the last election, but then came back down again. Now, this is the average increase for opposition parties. And what you can see is they often start low, they grow, they grow up to a peak and then often drop back again. Now, let me show you Keir Starmer against some individuals. Here we go. So there he is. Let's have a look to start with. David Cameron up to 2010. And you can see that Keir Starmer is rising at a faster rate than Cameron did at the beginning, although he did then surge up before dropping back. And that wasn't quite enough to get a majority, of course. That was the coalition government. Let's have a look at Ed Miliband. Pretty similar position to Keir Starmer and a little bit more of a rise afterwards. But as we know, 2015, he fell short. Let's have a look at Jeremy Corbyn. He was below, more of a spike in 2017, not so much in 2019. Next to all of them, in terms of the increase, Starmer looks good, but 
Let's add in Blair and show you what really good looks like. Look how high he went, 40 points up at one point compared to 1992. Now, one big difference for Starmer is that he's starting at a low position. So in order to get a majority, according to this analysis, he has to, by the next election, cross this dotted line all the way up there. For this, we have a... Geek of the Week. Geek of the Week, Dylan Spielman. Robert. Thanks. Fascinating stuff, uh... Anushka. So, uh, Lisa, that must make you feel pretty despondent because on that analysis, you can't possibly win the next election. Well, look, I think we've seen in recent years these huge upheavals in British politics. We've seen them around the world. I think what we've learned is that you don't prejudge the outcome of elections and we'd never be arrogant enough to assume that the British people will do one thing or another. What we do know is that we've had a huge mountain to climb. We lost a lot of trust in every nation and region of the UK over recent years. And we've got a lot of work to do to put that right. We've set about doing that. Keir has persuaded a lot of people to give Labour a second look in a very short amount of time. We've done that in the middle of a pandemic when, frankly, most people in this country are rightly willing the government to succeed in the battle against coronavirus. As are we, we want the country to come through this. So we've, you know, we've, we've said when we think the government is getting it wrong and we haven't been afraid to challenge, but we've also been unafraid to support them where they're getting it right. I think that's the right approach for a prime minister in waiting for somebody who aspires to lead this country oh. in a few years' time. But why and what you, you're why, starting why, why, to see now from Keir Starmer is him setting setting out not only what the government have got wrong over the last 11 years, but how Labour's going to set it right. But he had a sort of amazing... I mean, you know, as Anushka showed, he had an amazing um, honeymoon, great surge, and now it's almost... Well, not quite all of it, but a lot of it's now been lost. What, what's gone wrong? Well, I, I don't think anything's gone wrong. I just... I think that people are very focused on coronavirus. You know, the, the vaccine rollout has been a success, and we are enormously pleased about that. Um, we've been, you know, out around the country watching the NHS staff, the council workers, the armed forces who've pulled together with volunteers to make that a success. Um, and, uh, you know, I think what you're seeing is people starting to feel a little bit more optimistic about the future as the roadmap is published. Uh, we're pleased about that. We want the country to do well. And, w you know, we we've been setting out what we want to happen next. We've, we've done a really good job, our, our colleagues over in Wales, showing how to lead, how to make sure you get a grip on the health crisis, how to support people in difficult times. And over in Scotland, Anna Sawa, our new leader, young, energetic, future-focused, focused again relentlessly on the people of Scotland. I think there's a lot to be pleased about. We're nev we'll never be uh, complacent. Certainly, we sure. wouldn't even be complacent I, 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 the I, day that we enter Downing Street. I think you've Street, done your party political broadcast. But, but just to be clear, though, I mean, you, you had Starmer um, poking fun at... Um, the sort of, you know, I think, it, it, I think he called it brand Rishi and all the money that's... But what is brand Starmer? Some would, some would say he could do with a bit of branding. Oh, I've lost you. Oh, sorry, was that to me? I thought, yes. sorry, I thought that was to John. No. Um, I, I, think you, I think you saw exactly that from Keir Starmer today. But what is it? That, what is Brand Starmer? That he is, he is deeply committed to the people of this country. He believes in this country and he believes it can be better. It can be the best country in the world to grow up in and the best country to go old. But it can't be that country when we've got a government that is wedded to the same failed ideology that has let us down for so long, that led us into a global pandemic, we with family finances weakened, with four million children in poverty, with our public services on their knees. We've got to see a brighter future, and that means that we've got to get behind our businesses, our high streets, our young people, our older people, and our public servants to make sure that this country can succeed. That is what he set out today in response to Rishi Sunak. It wasn't just a critique of what's gone wrong. It was a plan for how you set it right, and you will see a lot more of that from Keir Starmer in the next and, weeks and months. And, and on a... We haven't got long, but just on a separate, completely separate issue. Um, you in the past have been um, a great supporter of Meghan Markle. What, what do you make of... Uh, it does look as though Buckingham Palace is sort of going to war with her now, with that leak about alleged bullying and now a formal investigation into alleged bullying. This is it's sort of an extra... I've never seen anything like this in the royal family. What do you make of it? I, it just looks like a very, very painful thing for any family to go through in the public spotlight. And, you know, I've learned as somebody who's been in the public eye a little bit, nothing like the sort of fame that the Queen has or Meghan Markle has or members of the royal family, but I've learned that you don't prejudge what's going on behind the scenes. I just wouldn't wish that on any family, really, and I hope that they, they're able to come through it. But, but why do you think they can't, in a sense, you know, why are they washing their dirty linen in public in this way? Well, you know, as I said, I can't prejudge what's happening. I mean, I don't 
don't know whether this is coming from members of the royal family. It may, it, you know, it may be people with an axe to grind who are who are stirring up trouble. I mean, you know, John will tell you we're no strangers to that in the Labour Party. People who wish us ill briefing about us. I, you know, I, I don't know, but I just hope that they come through it. As you said, I, I once said during the Labour leadership contest that I wanted Meghan Markle to play me in, in the film of my life. Um, and, I, you know, I, I, th I think she's great. I think she's her and Harry are a good thing, and I just hope that they can all come through this. Lovely as ever to see you, Lisa, and uh, we'll see you again soon.